Hello, welcome to Podcast and Practice. I'm David, and I am here with James. Hello. And Jamie. How are you? I just want to clarify, this is the Cultural Committee Anarchist Tendency. We have split from the <laughs> other group who decided to usurp our title. Jamie is attempting to play Peacemaker, as appearing on both of them, but I, I, don't, I don't really rate his chances on this one, to be honest. Talking about video games as both their art, as both their cinema. <laughs> Oh, what's the chances of you ever taking cinema seriously, Jamie? Slim. Are we? What? So Are what you... was it we're talking about there? Westworld. <laughs> <laughs> no, close, but no. Um, so today we're going to talk about the Jurassic Park franchise, namely the five. So dinosaur. Yeah, Westworld. dinosaur Westworld. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know that yeah, that, um... dino- that dinosaur Westworld take pretty much sums up. We can go home at this point. It's done. Cool. Same time next week, then? Yeah, yeah, sounds <laughs> yeah. good. <laughs> Bye. No, but seriously, I first watched Jurassic Park when I was like, when I must have been about five years old or something like that, and I remember it scaring the shit out of me. And watching it, I don't know how many times after that, which really only laid the framework for me to become a socialist so that I could constantly have misery and fear pulled over me at all times. It's a weird series of films because it gets. It starts off really strong, and then it goes a bit wobbly, and then it actually does get kind of good, and then it gets really wobbly again. No, nah, um, no, no, sorry, citation fucking needed on it does get kind of nah, good. No, I, well, well, wait, wait for it. Right, I will get to that film. I will get okay, to okay. The, the reboot film. No, um, hold on, wait, wait, wait a fucking second. You're saying the reboot film was okay? Right, I'm going to shut up now. I'm saving my anger for your take. <laughs> right, okay. Well, I think there's. I think this consensus, maybe you'd agree with me on this, Jamie, that the original Jurassic Park film is great and still holds up. I mean, I saw it in the cinema when it first came out, um, and all I really remember about it is my dad shit himself. <laughs> Wait, like, for real? Uh, well, let's say yes. <laughs> <laughs> so, like, was he drinking at the time, or just was that, was that T-Rex just too much? It was the bit with the... Um, the fucking power shed where Samuel L. Oh, Jackson's arm yeah. falls out of the yeah thing. yeah yeah okay that's yeah. uh absolutely wow. jumped out of his fu- literally jumped out of his fucking seat <laughs> and left <laughs> something behind by the sounds of it but that was that I, I saw it then and I've seen bits of it on telly since then and I'm aware that they made at least one more <laughs> yeah just that's just my good news for you just just oh. one more. So yeah, I came. I came prepared for this as ever. Yeah, oh, God. done your homework as per. It's okay. Just find a way to talk about the Colombian grieve, and we'll be fine. <laughs> Funnily enough, I mean one of the one of the arguments in the first film was that they could um, save birds from extinction. They oh, did bring up the Christ. condor in it, but like the the Colombian grebe would have been perfectly valid as well. Oh Christ! I don't know why I bother sometimes. Here we go. Okay. <laughs> okay. Oh. T- tell us all about how the first Jurassic Park is a metaphor for saving the Colombian grebe, David. Uh, I don't have anything like that, unfortunately. That was Jamie Stuffy's fucked it. Um, Jurassic Park 1 is a film all about capital's inability to defend from itself because of the inherent disunity required for the system to function. And, and about how Richard Attenborough mm. wants to shag a brontosaurus. <laughs> <laughs> Why not? I mean, God himself decreed that there would be no dinosaur shagging, but science has decided otherwise. Yeah, attack and dethrone God. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, do not fuck the dinosaurs, please. Well, I don't know. Actually, hang on, right? Let's stop a second. Is it more or less Mm -hmm. Christian to want to fuck dinosaurs? Because I'm pretty sure those fundamentalist Christian, the Earth is 6,000 years old parks, have mankind alongside dinosaurs, right? I think it's on the same level as shagging dogs. So, like, a thing... Yeah, you know what? I, I was going to make a very mean joke there, but I'm not going to make it. I'm not going to make it. For libel purposes... Was that purposes, about Ian Austin? 
uh, for sorry, the, the podcast uh, solicitor is back on the phone again and is telling me to uh, just offer a no comment. <laughs> oh, right. Well, that that's that's the take. It's, it's a fairly look one take, and I think it's an accurate reading um, of the film. Uh, the, the entire part goes to complete shit because uh, Dennis Nedry, the IT guy they've hired to run all of the systems for the park, decides fuck it and he steals some intellectual property and sell, tries to sell it to uh, uh, I can't remember the fucking name of them but let's let's just call them Monsanto right um, and he tries to sell this off to like a rival firm and that's why everything goes to shit see since you said Monsanto I'm now picturing him just wanting to like serve dinosaur steaks like they want to eat the dinosaurs that's why Monsanto wants a hold of them would you put it past them I mean, it's Masanto, no, they're comic book evil, so they'll do pretty much anything. <laughs> that, that, that's the take there. That's, that's a fairly simple, straightforward take. However, if you want to be a shithead and read it in as liberal a way as possible... Of course. Jurassic Park 1 is a lesson in the dangers of individual greed and what can happen if you're not a good enough boss... Consider for a moment that if John Hammond had just thrown a little off his pizza party, Dennis <laughs> Nedry might not have stolen all that DNA and wiped out the park and killed everyone. Again, you could argue that perhaps a union that had been formed could have saved Jurassic Park as well, but that's not a very liberal reading, so we're not going to go down that route. Also, unionising dinosaurs is hard. I mean, it's it's really it's a metaphor for like any government IT project, really, isn't it? You know what I mean? They, they... You didn't do the IT properly and everything fell apart. It's Tony Blair trying to develop an internet time zone. Jesus fucking Christ. Do you ever sometimes feel like there's a part of your brain which is stirring lizard-like, dinosaur-like, in fact, after a very long <laughs> hibernation and shaking off layers of dust and detritus to lumber forward with a, hey, you remember that thing that's just been mentioned? The internet fucking time zone no, I, is... I, honestly, I think about Tony Blair's, like foolhardy attempt to create an internet time zone at least twice a week it's like it's one of the the fucking greatest things i've ever seen in my life do you know what i mean i don't know how much money they actually spent on trying to do that but whoever whoever actually got paid to try and come up with that saw him fucking coming <laughs> like anyone who, who is aware of the concept of physics knows that that's not going to work but they took like several million quid off the, the fucking prick do you know what I mean and just ran away with it I mean for all we know it was one of his mates who's like Tony Tony I've got a great wheeze I've got a great way to feather the nest here and like pitches him on it and Tony says yeah I'll, I'll, I'll pitch that and we'll, we'll, you know, we'll push for public money your way no worries mate like was, I wouldn't put that past him he was one of, one of Cherie's energy healers <laughs> and I'll just sat around in robes trying to like transcend time and get it to conform to the internet. I feel like I've got the ghosts of the Roman fucking legion marching from my head right now with just all these ancient facts about <laughs> vampire like people that should have perished long ago. I know there as a as the Roman cavalry choirs are singing out the praises of Cherry Blair and her faith crystal healing bullshit and the hanging crystals in the sunlight to charge them thing. <laughs> Christ <laughs> almighty. And her smile. Why is it the Blairs both had weird smiles? Fuck knows. <clears throat> That's above my pay grade, to be honest. Like, Do you ever think when they have like a meeting of energy healers, do you ever think an electrician's turned up by mistake? <laughs> <laughs> Just I'm, some guy with shock paddles, like, what the fuck? <laughs> no, I'm, I'm picturing like a, a, a doctor's turned up as well for like, you know, electroshock therapy. It's like going, ah, yes, so I'm good. This is, uh, you know, it's been a long maligned practice, but it's good to see there's such a vibrant support for it. We've, we've really civilized the methods in recent. Oh, oh, wait a minute. I am in the wrong place. <laughs> some, some guy sat around trying to put a bandage on a lightning bolt. I'm just picturing the I'm just picturing the electroshock doctor also going, Vo, since I'm here, many of you look like you could be in need of electroshock therapy. <laughs> oh Christ. Oh dear. It's like it's like that fucking Nancy Reagan and like, you know, drawing tarot cards to decide American foreign policy, except with healing crystals. It's the NAF version of Reagan. Tony Blair is the NAF version of Reagan. Where's that take? I mean they both wanted to bomb Thatcher, so that checks out. <laughs> No, I think there's a subtle difference here. I think Reagan wanted to bum Thatcher, right? But I think Tony wanted to be bummed by Thatcher and was just, you know, 
both of them were ultimately destined for disappointment if you go by the, the lurid tales of Thatcher having to have anal sex explained to her. So, Shall we move swiftly on? Yeah, please, let's. Yeah, please. <laughs> Certainly, please. Um, okay. Um, the second film, right. Uh, Jamie, I regret to inform you there was a second film. You're fucking shitting me. No, no. sorry. Sorry about that. I know it's, no it's, it's completely unheard of for like really successful films in Hollywood to get like a cringe worthy number of like spin offs. But what can I say? Steven Spielberg, total money whore, you know, no artistic vision. And so when they came to him and said, hey, we want to do a sequel, we're going to call it The Lost World Jurassic Park. He was like, well, you know, this isn't what Hollywood normally does, but I'm just so fucking greedy for the money. Let's fucking go. Well, I'm going to assume. I'm going to assume the second film is that having lost all of his money on on like these big islands the first time around, the second one it's like you know he's just running a uh, wet and wild somewhere with pterodactyls. <laughs> <laughs> no, although that would have probably made a better film. Although that pretty much like, actually we'll get to that actually I'll come back to that point soon. And then by the by the third <laughs> film it's just like you know a, a, a raptor doing bouncy castle higher. <laughs> The second film brings back uh, Jeff Goble. And who the fuck else is in that film now? I'm, I'm totally blanking on it. A, a bunch of also rans. Really, it is just Jeff yeah. Goldblum is the only one in it who's got... Presumably some dinosaurs? The, there's some dinosaurs in it. Vince Vaughn's in it. Um, is he? Now. I don't fucking remember that. I mean, who, whoever, whoever does remember Vince Vaughn's in things? Literally watch, like... Films that were Vince Vaughn vehicles, you could watch them and go like, shit, is Vince Vaughn in this? <laughs> okay, that is actually fair. I mean, I bet that's his wife reaction, wife's reaction when she gets home. <laughs> she wakes up in the morning, rolls over and goes, fuck me. I thought he was dead. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, Jeff Goldblum comes back because it turns out, wait for it, there was a second island. Right? They never built a park on it. They just let the dinosaurs do their thing and they would breed them all there and they would move them from that island to the island with a park on it. But, you know, and that seems wildly irresponsible. Like, I'm going yes, to... I'm going to stand up because I did actually fucking read up on this just to refresh my memory. And there is an explanation, mm. which is that they made them on Site B, which was just meant to be like the clinical development site. And so that has very mm. different kind of needs to Site A, which is the showy like park. But then mm -hmm. a really bad storm came through and wrecked everything unexpectedly, so they had to abandon the island and basically like shift the dinosaurs they had as like babies off of it and leave the rest to just kind of die out was the plan. Um, yeah. And that's what led to like in Site A they have all these like you know big concern about the storm rolling in. It's because previously another site got completely wrecked by it. So whoever like came up with that sequence of like back explanation about it all did like the minimum required to kind of get across, oh, there's another island, which on its face is an incredibly dumb way to kind of do it. Yeah. Um I've never heard the word so back explanation before, but it does make me think of Shaft. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Jamie, unpack that one a little for me. Why does it make you think of Shaft? Because it sounds a bit like black exploitation. <laughs> Checks out. No arguments. Yep. All right, moving yep. on, David. Um, right, so Hammond, who is like losing control of the business and everything because, as he's, the first film was proven, he's a complete fucking hack fraud. He's who spared no expense. No expense spared whatsoever. Um, he sends Jeff Goldblum and Vince Vaughn and some other guy away to the island to meet the paleontologist that he's already sent, who is played by... I'm going to need to Google it. Hang on. Do you want me to tell you? I've actually got the Wikipedia article open right here. Yeah, I mean, if, if Vince Vaughn's in it, I'm going to guess it's Owen Wilson. It's not Owen Wilson. Wow. It, uh, nope, nope. Well, ironically, uh, Vince Vaughn's character is Nick Van Owen. So, mm. like, you're late of heavening this in real time, Jamie. <laughs> no, uh, it's Julianne Moore. She plays Dr. That's Sarah it. Harding. Yes. So they all go to the island. Goldblum's purely there to get her off the island because they're, they're, they're a couple at this point and he's there to get, tell her, come the fuck home, this is dangerous as shit because he's the only person in the entire fucking series who seems to get this idea that dinosaurs are dangerous and bad and we shouldn't fuck with them. Another team gets sent by the guy that's taken over Hammond's company. I think it's his nephew yep. who the company's been left to. Um... 
they come in, they do a big grand fucking safari hunting thing, they tranquilise a bunch of dinosaurs and cage them up, and Vince Vaughn doesn't like this because he used to work for Greenpeace, and he sets them all free. They rescue a young Tyrannosaurus as well, um, that was shot by one of the, the hunters and the other team, and try and make it better, and then all the other dinosaurs are released, so the camp gets fucked up. Their shit gets fucked up because two Rexies just found out that their baby was missing and no one's got anything left apart from some guns and the clothes on their back, so they all need to try and get off the island. We, we, you would expect the film to end there, um, but it doesn't, and for some reason a T-Rex is brought back to the mainland and Rex downtown San Francisco. Uh, you see, I have seen that bit on the telly because I remember, like, I remember wondering, like, the, the ship comes into fucking California and the, they open the hold and the T-Rex bursts out. But how the fuck did it kill all of the crew? Like, you don't steer a boat from the hold. So, like, what did it get out? Like, kill all the crew in the in the cabin, steer the boat in, in the dock itself, and then lock itself back in the fucking hold? <laughs> it's, uh, like, I'm going to give them a tiny little bit of credit for this one. Because you're totally right, Jamie. You're absolutely correct. But what they're doing is they're doing a homage to Dracula, Right. And, like, I can't, you know, all right, okay, I see what they're doing. It's totally, it doesn't fit with the logic of the film, but if you if you suspend disbelief and just go, like, all right, okay, so it's a Dracula homage, it's, like, spooky vampire T-Rex kind of tones, then fine. So I mean, cause, honestly, I'd have been fine with it if the T-Rex was wearing a cape. Mine, I'm just picturing, like, the T-Rex with, like, you know, a toupee and fangs and the cape and like it's roaring in a bad Transylvanian impression accent kind of thing like that would have improved that last arc of the film dramatically I tell you what else that would have would have improved as well is BBC's Dracula <laughs> so I haven't seen it but I have heard stories I have heard wild tales I saw I saw the last 15 minutes of it um, on, and it was it was honestly one of the dumbest fucking things I've ever seen in my life so I, incredibly on brand for those two idiots that wrote Sherlock. Yeah, like I heard that everything up to the last fifteen minutes was actually quite good, and people oh, were like, I "Holy I shit!" I didn't see that bit. I just saw well, the grand finale. So, so I have a friend who was watching the first episode, and they said, "I've never been more angry at a TV product for getting my hopes up." And I was like, "What do you mean?" It's like, okay, so I went in with no expectations. I thought it would just be abysmally dog shit because of who was making it, and then like the first arc of the the, the first episode, it's like this is good. This is actually like, this is spooky and it's like coming together. And then the last 15 minutes apparently just fucking ruin it. And then the rest of the series is just like the car is off the cliff and plummeting and free fall while on fire. And he still watched it. So I've got no fucking sympathy, but it's good to hear that, you know, it's someone from podcasting his practice has actually watched it and, or at least 15 minutes of it and has like confirmed that because it means I can strike it from any proto list I had of shit I want to watch sometime when I hate myself I mean honestly I would recommend watching the last 15 minutes of it just, just to, <laughs> oh shit is it that bad incredibly fucking stupid it is yeah does it really does it wrap back around that hard it's oh, so bad honestly, it's good it's so fucking I mean I, I obviously I wasn't planning on watching it or anything I just saw the last 15 minutes at someone's house but I was like I was expecting it to be complete dog shit because Sherlock was fucking terrible it was. Mm. But, um, but holy fuck, like, they outdid themselves. So is it the sort of thing that it was so bad that if you had known how bad it was going to be, you would have made time to see it? I mean, probably not. Let's, let's not go nuts. But it was oh, fucking, wow. it was just incredible. I mean, those two, those two fucking guys, it's Gattis and Moffat. Yeah. yeah. They, they have just, I have to applaud just how far up their own arseholes they disappear when they're writing things. Mm -hmm. It's genuinely impressive to watch. Like, Well, it's like, you know, it's the whole white men failing upward kind of shit. It's like those um, Game of Thrones writers. And I don't like Game of Thrones. Mm. And I didn't particularly rate the TV series, but I understand why people were so angry at the last series. Uh, do you see what it is? The, the, the Game of Thrones, the Game of Thrones writers, the, 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 the fucking great thing about that is it's like everyone loves that show. And then they're like, oh, we need to get it done really quickly. Everyone loves a show. And we're like, really hot properties now. And we want to do that really ill-advised horse shit about what, what if America was still racist because the Civil War never ended or whatever the fuck that was going to... I mean, imagine if there were yeah. still racists running America. 
It's, um, it's fucking <laughs> unthinkable. And they had a Star War they were going to do, and and so it was like, right, okay, we haven't got time for this Game of Thrones shit anymore. Like, yeah, what, what? There was another six seasons worth. We're wrapping it up in like four episodes. Get on board, everyone. And it was such utter <laughs> dog shit that they immediately got like fired from Confederacy and like Star Wars and whatever else. They were going to just disappeared into the fucking ether. I know. It's it's like. It's pretty funny because it has also kind of wrecked Game of Thrones now for everyone who was like, oh, Game of Thrones is so good. They can't, because they can't, they're so angry about it, they can't bring themselves to watch it. You know, they're like, oh, I mean, the first few seasons were good, but it doesn't matter because it all just turns to dog shit. Game of Thrones is definitely the, the, the show I least expected to turn out to be lost. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it checks out. What was a mystery box? What was in the mystery box? Two white men who were far above their capabilities writing a show they fundamentally didn't give a shit about in order to, you know, ride the gravy train to Disney box. Yeah, cool. Makes sense. Checks out, yeah. Anyway, so, you, you had a fucking take about yeah. a second movie, David. So yeah, what do the robots in Westworld represent? <laughs> Jurassic Park 2, from the liberal point of view, a lesson in the importance of respecting private property. Oh, Christ, right, yeah, all right. How'd you get to that one? Everyone on that island would have been fine and wouldn't have died if Vince Vaughn hadn't disrespected private property. Oh, Because fuck all those it. dinosaurs were the property of InGen. Oh, fuck And it. if he hadn't released them all, they would have all got off that island fine. Christ almighty, David, I, I hate I, it. I, I genuinely thought you were going to say that, like, you know, you, you disrespected the, the social contract by stealing the baby from the two T-Rexes. <laughs> and since the, no. island, since the island didn't have a small claims court, they had no other choice but to fuck everyone up. <laughs> no, I see, that's you. You're not, you're not up on your ideology there, Jamie, because liberals have no problem with children being sold on the open market. There's very famous articles about it. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. Mm. Uh, I'm glad the takes are, are, are hitting a wee bit hotter now. That's that's good. I thought you would like that one. Um, oh God. It's like, it gets me, so like he's a fucking Greenpeace guy and he's like, no, they should be free. And it's like, yeah, all right, I've met the type and I can sort of like, I can sort of see it. But it just, it didn't, it didn't, my brain didn't fill in the rest of that, which is, of course, the fucking libs would be, well, you know, if this activist hadn't been, you know, if this eco-terrorist uh -huh. hadn't freed these dinosaurs. <laughs> fucking hell. I hate it because it has such a grain of truth in it, you know? Yeah, right. Jamie, they made a third film. Right. Oh, you're never going to guess the title of this one, by the way. Because, I mean, for the second one, they called it The Lost World Jurassic Park. So, you know, they're going to pull out all the stops for the third title. Two Jurassic Park. <laughs> <laughs> Two oh, Jurassic, no. Two Park. <laughs> um, it was Jurassic Park 3. Tokyo Drift. <laughs> <laughs> right, Jurassic Park 3, the plot of this one is even more contrived. This time, rather than it being Jeff Goldblum they get back, they get Sam Neill back. Right. And the film the film opens with uh, like a, a, just a little boat, a little speedboat type thing, and there's a guy and a child, and they, they go away up in a... a is that a parasail? Para, you know, it's, it's parachute, but it's tied to the boat. Yeah, I think, is it is it parasailing? Parasailing. I think, para I think it's parasailing. It's not paragliding. I'm, it pretty, I'm pretty sure paragliding is when you leap off like a cliff or something holding it. Yeah, yeah. It's, uh, do you know what? I'm going to call it parasailing. And if I'm wrong, fucking at me about it. I don't care anyway. I won't read it. Yeah. Um, um, yeah cubes. If, if we're wrong, leave us a fucking snotty comment on, on uh, pod, <laughs> Podbean and I'll get back to you. I'm so happy we finally reached a point where we're starting to get people be really arsy about the content we put out. <laughs> it's great. It, it's superb. It's everything I dreamed it could be. Especially since the episode that we started to take shit over was objectively good and had an excellent guest on it. <laughs> anyway. Anyway. Um, yeah, so. They're on this boat. They're in the middle of the fucking ocean. There's, there's an island right there and they go away up and it's, it's Jurassic fucking tools or whatever on the, on the parachute. And they're looking if they can see anything, and then the boat goes through some mist, and then suddenly there's no one on the boat, and then the boat goes to crash, and they pull the parachute off, but the the rope, and they they fly away to the island, um, and then the parents of the child turn up to Sam Neil and con him into like a, a flyover of the island. They get there and they land on the island, 
turns out it's the same island from the second film, so Sam Neill's never been there. And the whole plan immediately goes to complete shit because they get destroyed. Um, the plane gets absolutely fucked up by a Spinosaurus and they're stuck on the island again and there's no way off it and it's the, the usual kind of shit. Um, there's like nothing really else to say about this film. There really is. I don't think. There, there's like, not. I mean, my only question would be what the fuck is a Spinosaurus? I would probably have known the answer to that when I was eight, but not anymore. It's a, it's a pretty fucking big dinosaur. Like, I remember... So they have a Spinosaurus in it as for, oh, this thing's badder than a T-Rex, is the way Hollywood does. Like, it has to escalate everything. Like it's wearing a and, fucking leather jacket and shades. Yeah, <laughs> no, it's, it's, it's a real bad boy of a dinosaur world. And it actually, like, they straight up have a fight scene where, where the Spinosaurus fucks up a T-Rex just to show you how, like, serious it was. But apparently they were actually huge. And the one that's in the movies, they actually went with quite a young juvenile in order to kind of make it look like a vaguely fair fight between the T-Rex and the Spinosaurus. It's called a Spinosaur... Yeah, it's called a Spinosaurus because it has really big fucking spines on its back. Go figure. Right. Really, mm. uh, you know, pushing a bow out in the naming conventions, paleontologists are. Mm. Fun fact, um, someone who was... I can't remember who exactly it was to do with the film, but they confirmed that the the T-Rex that gets murdered by it, um, that's confirmed to be the baby T-Rex from the film before. Of course, all of course up. it is. So, yeah, yeah just, just fuck you. Yeah, fuck you, that's that's why. Um, is, there, is there anything Vince Vaughn isn't to blame for? Well, Vince Vaughn isn't in this one. Um, so you could potentially argue that um, all of this happens because of a lack of Vince Vaughn. <laughs> the whole film builds up and it gets, it gets stupid and stupid as it goes on. Um, like, there's, there's a whole plot thread where, like... The, the two parents are actually separated and they slowly get back together through it as if we're supposed to care about that because it's really fucking pathetic and contrived. And there's this little bit about how the dad learned to swim. He used to hate swimming, but he's learned to swim since they've separated. And then him being able to swim somehow like, saves them for the Spinosaurus later on because he's got a flare gun or some shit. I can't fuck it. I can barely remember now. This honestly sounds like someone in a pub trying to explain a film to someone else. You know, that you're, you're only I mean, overhearing at the next table. Like, <laughs> I mean... He, he learns to swim and he's got he's got a flare gun and that's somehow related to him swimming. <laughs> like, I mean, I'd, honestly, right. if you watched the film and tried to explain it back to me, you would, you would repeat it like this as well. Genuinely reminds me of being in a pub once and hearing like... There was two people at, like at the next table, and one of them was recounting the plot of the Dark Knight to his friend who hadn't seen it, and just oh, spoiling the whole fucking film for him. And his mate was completely unimpressed, and he was going, "Oh, but it's dead good because every time he explains the scars, it's like a different story." And his mates just sat there like stony faced. <laughs> it was fucking great. Like it was, it was possibly more entertaining than the fucking film, to be honest. <laughs> oh man! <laughs> oh fucking hell! Everything you need to know about Jurassic Park 3 can be summed up by a single segment from the film, right? Um, David, can I can I give a little summary here? Because I think this, this sums up it, yeah. how little thought went into it. Okay. So Grant, Dr. Grant gets separated from the you know, con man parents and their couple of mercenaries that they brought along. Dr. Grant ends up being rescued by the little plucky kid who has survived on the island. Um, he's made a den for himself in like an overturned truck and he's been living like, you know, Robinson Crusoe style meets Bear Grylls survival man kind of stuff, okay? So uh, including this is, Sorry, this is aliens then? Kind of, yeah, right? Um, he's even been, like, he's been collecting T-Rex urine and using it to scare off other dinosaurs, except it attracts this big one, he says, obviously meaning the Spinosaurus, right? Anyway, so later on, Grant and little kid are in a jungle when they hear the sound of a cell phone ringing, like a, a proper like cellular satellite oh, phone. Jesus. And uh, the kid's like, that's my dad's cellular phone. And they follow the sound and they make it to a big fuck off fence like in the original Jurassic Park. You know, would be an electrified fence, but there's no electricity. Big heavy duty steel, reinforced struts, multiple cable. Like the real, like this thing is fucking huge. Okay. And the parents are on the other side and come running towards them. And, oh, it's a tearful reunion. But my dad asks, but, but how did you find us? And the kid's like, oh, I fall, I fall for the sound of your stupid cell phone. My stupid cell phone? Well, that was last held by Minor Forgettable B character. Minor Forgettable B character got eaten by the Spinosaurus. 
So then they all turn around and comically just standing in the middle of the field right next to them is the fucking Spinosaurus with the thing ringing in its belly, right? Nice. And now you're kind of like, hang on a minute. Like the T-Rex gives a big thumb, thumb, thumb when it comes walking. Famously, that was a point in the first film with a glass of water. And you're telling me this thing is just like quietly snuck up on everyone? That's like a thing it can do. Okay. So this then leads to, a, oh shit, the, the kid and Grant are on the same side of the fence as the Spinosaurus, but they go legging it away from the thing, which is canonically faster than a T-Rex. I remember in the first film how they had the whole like fucking Jeep running away from a T-Rex and they had to like floor it at 50 miles an hour to escape the thing, right? And it was still keeping up. No, no, this is two people on foot legging it along the fence. Conveniently, there is a person-sized, and I literally mean person-sized, hole in the fence mm. that the two of them get through, and the Spinosaurus is on the other side, and everyone's like, oh, oh, it's, oh close escape. Then the Spinosaurus is just fucking battering rams through the fence, and you're like, oh shit, here we go. So they run to a nearby visitor center, again, on foot. No one gets caught and eaten. They get in the door, they slam the doors shut, the wooden doors, and they start drawing the bolts on the wooden doors. Now, what's the fucking problem with this picture, given what the film has literally just shown you less than 60 seconds before, right? I mean, the, the two things that immediately spring to my mind are if the, if the, there's no lucky for the fence, it sounds like they need an energy healer. And um, <laughs> <laughs> the thing about the T-Rex, like, shaking the ground when it, uh, when it turns up, got thrown out by the end of the first film. I, well, a little bit, but at the same time, it's like fucking hell. Now, here's the thing. There's no consistency with the stuff established in the previous films at all. And second of all, there's just no kind of thought put into it. Hang on. This thing just crashed its way through a massive big fuck off steel fence. And we're going to draw the bolts on. Oh, I forgot to mention it rams the doors a couple of times too. Now, mm. this is a thing that just rammed through a metal fence like it was nothing. Yeah, just, you know, I mean, it's a, it's a visitor centre, maybe informational pamphlets or it's kryptonite. I mean, yes. It's not even a visitor centre. Oh, yeah. What is it again, David? I can't it's, fucking... It's the aviary for all the pterodactyls. Oh, yeah, of course. Of course. But it still is just a plain fucking door and this thing just hammered yeah. its way through. Like, it's so stupid. It's nothing special. And, and that's the thing. It's like... There's no shot by shot thought put into the action that's actually taken place. Like you can say many things about Spielberg, but he does actually think shit through. And he like, you know, he does yeah. he does kind of go, no, hang on, the logic of this doesn't hold up. We need to come up with something a bit more creative. Um, which he's done many times in the past. But for this film, despite him being an executive producer, which I guess means he put his name on it and got paid, um, it's just consistently the film is a sequence of events which don't make any sense if you stop to think about them for half a second, even in context with stuff they've just shown. And so when David's spluttering around saying there's, there's a flare gun and the guy learned how to swim and this was very important for some way I can't quite articulate, like that's because the entire film is like this. But it's just it's a series of little set pieces that they just sort of ram together going, oh yeah, and yes and we can then do the following with no actual revision of thought put into it. Like I can see why this killed the Jurassic Park series for a good few years. Hmm. Yeah. And important to note at the very end of the film as well. All of a sudden the, the film just ends. Yeah, because the does. military turn up to save them. It, it just fucking ends. A bunch of marines swarm onto the beach and save them, and then they, they all go home, and that's it. Just Finn. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah, straight up. It's like, oh, the military, you're like, you know, we're, they're here to save us as they're doing, like, fucking beach landings. And, man, so this is one of those films that got, like, military funding, and, you know, for that reason, the military get to review the script, etc., but it means we get to use, like, real, like, actual military to deploy, okay? And you look at when Jurassic Park 3 was made, okay? Um, and if I remember the publication date for it, uh, right, it was in 2001, which means we we're probably making it in 2000. So here's all these fucking Marines who've been called up and like, okay, we've got a special assignment for today. What's the special assignment? We're going to be participating in the new Jurassic Park film. Oh yeah, hell yeah, let's go fuck up some dinosaurs. Oorah. Well, not exactly. We're going to do some beach landings in front of some cameras. Oh, well, shit. There's at least, there's a good odds that at least one guy on there, as they're doing this, goes, I mean, fucking, I guess this is what I signed up for. It's not like there's going to be anything more serious in the next little while. Like, it's also important to note as well here that the military turn up because they they get a hold of that satellite phone 
after the recurring after the gag actually happens again with it ringing oh, and yeah. find it in a pile of shit and it's part of the whole swimming sequence that happens and they make a phone call and Sam Neill phones Laura Dern whose only purpose in the film is to be the wife of a senator or some shit like that it's some yeah. fucking government position anyway um, and that's the only reason the military come it's because of that that's it that's the, the only tenuous ability for them to go off the island was, was that to have Laura Dern in the film of that Hey, listen, uh, sugar daddy senator, my ex-boyfriend has done fucked up and got himself in dinosaur jail. Can you bail him out, please? I'm just, I'm liking the, I'm liking the, the idea of like a bunch of US Marines just like storming a beach and, and like machine gun and some green screen. They're probably the most, the most effective they've, they've ever been in combat. At the time, yeah, like, that's what I'm saying. They were going into that going, man, I mean, this is what we signed up for. It's not like there's going to be any, any major complex in the next little while. Then fucking 9-11 happens on their asses. And then fast forward, like, nine, 19 years from that, and they're getting chased off Twitch. Because people <laughs> won't stop asking them about war crimes. <laughs> Get me the US Marines. My wife's boyfriend is in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's... You joke, but that's basically the plot of every Tom Clancy film. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yes, absolutely, yes. <laughs> oh fucking hell! God damn! Right, um, Empire in decline, everyone. Mm, yeah, so that's that's what the film is, right? And we've actually fucking got through the film. Um, the whole film is to, to link it to capitalism. Like the only reason they get to that island is that the, the family hires a bunch of mercenaries to take them, even though it's a fucking stupid idea. Genuinely thought that was going to be like, well, the only reason they get to that island is because capitalism invented the boat. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I mean, listen, listen, you can say what you like about the failures of capitalism, but without capitalism, there's no fucking dinosaurs, you know? Yeah. Capitalism invented dinosaurs, so... Yeah. It's true. You, yeah. Say, you say you don't like capitalism, but you're wearing shoes. How curious. <laughs> I am very smart. <laughs> mm. Yeah, capitalism can't be trusted to leave well enough alone because it needs to stick its dick in every mouth that it sees, regardless of how many teeth are in the mouth. Is pretty much the lesson on that one. So basically, Attenborough is the incarnation of capitalism. He's like the avatar of capitalism, wanting to fuck a dinosaur. Is that what you're going with, David? Have have, have any of the Jurassic Park films ever had an Elon Musk cameo? No, not yet. By they God, it would fit, though. They need to get on that, to be honest. Yeah. like It could almost certainly happen in the next one. Okay, so the thing about Elon Musk in like a future Jurassic Park, though, you could totally mm. make that work. You could do the logical thing that Hollywood does and do dinosaurs in space and just have, like, for some constrained, like, set, there's a bunch of velociraptors loose on the International Space Station. And so Elon Rusk, Elon Rusk, Elon Musk has to fly a... Adult baby Elon Rusk. <laughs> just one fucking T-Rex on the International Space Station just with its arms poking out through the sides. Like, just filling the internal space completely, like, wearing it like a fucking suit of armour. This is a one thing we didn't want to happen. Yeah, while, like, Ian Rush or whoever you said is trying to fight it off. <laughs> oh, fucking hell. Oh, yeah, that, that was the end of the Jurassic Park films. Thank God, we can all go home. And then they rebooted them, kind of. Christ, here we go again. Yeah, the old soft reboot. Um, so they made Jurassic World, I think that was, what, 2015 that came out? Um, uh, yes, Jurassic World was 2015, and then yep. Fallen Kingdom was 2018, yes. Oh, you spoiled it. You didn't know there was a fifth one. Ah, oh, shit. I'm sorry, Jamie. That's, I'm sure I'll manage. I'll, I'll post through the pain. <laughs> <laughs> right, so Jurassic World is... Uh, what of Jurassic Park, but they actually managed to open the park. That's pretty much what it is. This is the one with the, uh, the dude with the raptors on the motorbike. Yes. Yes. Yeah, I've seen the trailer for this. There yep. is... Uh... <laughs> Done my research. <laughs> 
<laughs> but it's like a, there's a there's a funny story about the velociraptors and the motorbike at some point. So come back to me after you've done your take, David, and I'll mm. I'll tell you the behind but, the scenes of how these films got made. See what it is. You, you've bigged that up now, and in my mind, the funny story is like the him riding the motorbike with all the velociraptors on on his shoulders, like a fucking pyramid. Do you know what I mean? Just <laughs> going down the M4 or something. The like that bit of one about the fucking dinosaurs that are loose. Like the bit in Wallace and Gromit, the, the close shave where all the sheep are like, you know, on the motorbike and they go through the tunnel. Yeah. <laughs> exactly oh, that. <laughs> Can I just say, I recently rewatched the entire, like, the entire Wallace and Gromit stuff is on Netflix UK, and I recently rewatched it all from start to finish because I had a lot of time on my hands. And they are objectively a stronger, better series than the Jurassic Park series. Like, they, they hold up incredibly well. Yeah, it checks out. Jurassic World is uh, it's it's kind of the same idea, like, you know, you bring people to the island, except the people in the island are actually fucking thousands of them. Um, the difference this time is that you can't just do dinosaurs again. What they've had to do is they've had to do like GM dinosaurs. What, what if dinosaurs, but with more dinosaurs in them? But the thing was the original were GM dinosaurs. Which... Yes. <sighs> Do you know, right, I'll be honest, I actually thought the original thing was quite clever because mm -hmm. they, they kind of, in the film, they said, oh, we had to splice their DNA to patch up things. So whilst they're dinosaurs, they're not exactly the original dinosaurs and they kind of covered their arse in case we learned anything like, for example, yeah. dinosaurs had feathers, which we later did. Um, and so they like, they covered it up. But then you get to this film like, ah, yes, well, we need to, we need to custom genetic engineer dinosaurs. And it's like, you literally did that. Well, that is the first film. In, in fairness, they, they they do kind of acknowledge that in that, but they, they it's not just that they've spliced like frog DNA and shit into dinosaurs that like they did in the first film. It's they've uh -huh. spliced other dinosaurs DNA into like one. So there's multiple dinosaurs in this one, and it's um it's part T Rex and part Raptor because of course it is. Yep. Um. And the films, it's largely so what the is same. That, what, does that actually, that, what does that actually mean in like science, practical scientific terms? It's part T Rex, and does it have bigger arms than normal? Or? It's it's like, like, like it yeah, can it's adjust, like it, a, it can adjust its own spectacles. That sort of oh thing. no, it, it can. It also has chameleon DNA. This is an important plot point. Cuttlefish. Oh, is it cuttlefish? Right, fuck it. It's cuttlefish. So I paid too much attention to that film. Um, yeah, so it can change color, so it can like camouflage itself. It can hide. It's got snake DNA, so it can hide from like thermal sensors and shit. It's it's just it's over the top as fuck, and it can overwhelm all the modern technology available. This sounds like they had some the script right. The screenwriters had some intern with like Wikipedia open, just like yelling at them to pick out interesting things animals can do. <laughs> I, yeah, this is all covered in that one scene exactly for that purpose. It's got octopus DNA, so it can escape from aquariums and hide inside a coconut. <laughs> <laughs> like, the thing that gets me about the snake one in particular, and listeners, if I'm wrong on this, please feel free to at me at Wizard Cubes if I'm wrong about this. <laughs> but, like, my understanding is the reason snakes hide from infrared kind of imaging is because they're cold-blooded and thus they have the temperature of their ambient environment, right? That's basically it. No, it's a, magic, nothing... it's a magic power. They're all actually X-Men. <laughs> Sorry, you've just put... My brain has just shitposted a snake wearing, like, a Wolverine costume or some shit. <laughs> Giant mutton chops down its head. Just going... <laughs> spub, spub, like, over and over again. See, when I said when I said it's got octopus DNA so it can hide in a coconut, I immediately pictured like a fucking giant coconut in the middle of the park while all like while Chris, <laughs> Chris Pratt and everyone just parade around scratching their heads like three feet away, wondering where it's gone. Or oh, that. Oh, that's just the genetically engineered mega coconut we made for like unrelated reasons. This attraction will open soon. <laughs> yeah, they, they've bred giant coconuts to absolutely fuck up some guy who's really good at the fair. <laughs> you know what I mean he turns up and he's just got like an absolutely fucking grotesquely muscular right arm and they just plonk this like fucking the, the gherkin skyscraper but with like hair coming off it in front of him knock that over you fucking prick they had a whole exhibit planned it's why all the transport vehicles in the third one are weird spherical kind of like the little hamster balls rolling around is because we were remaining entirely on brand for the coconut opening. <laughs> right. 
the film is, like I say, it's largely the same, except this super mutant dinosaur escapes and just starts killing everything just wildly. And then the other side of this is that the raptors are good guys now. Um, so Chris Pratt has trained some raptors for, like, tricks and shit, and the military's interested in, like, what are their applications and shit like that. With, and, their, with their very interesting names of Bravo, Charlie, Delta, and Echo. Right. Can they use guns? It's blue, blue, not Bravo, but yeah. Um, no, they can't use guns. That was in a rejected script, though. Um, oh, the rejected I'm scripts are fucking well, wild. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, the rejected scripts are what I want to talk about when you're done, David. Anyway, See, I was, carry on. I was say, yes. They can't use guns. What fucking use is it in the military? Do you know what I mean? Well, strap in, Jamie. This is going in wild directions. Anyway, carry on, David. Yeah. Um, one line specifically. Um, when, at one point, they released, the, they released the raptors to hunt down the big fuck off mutant, thinking the only thing that can kill a dinosaur that we can't kill is another dinosaur. Um, and the, the military guys sitting in the control room watching, like, they've, they've strapped cameras to the fucking heads of the raptors and shit, it's wild. Um, and it's like, they've got full night vision and shit like that. And and he's, trained, they... he's trained them to do tricks and film documentaries. <laughs> <laughs> the only thing that can stop a bad man with a dinosaur is a good man with a dinosaur <laughs> is very much the direction this series is going in. <laughs> But he actually says at one point, can you imagine if we had these babies in Tora Bora? As if, like, they would just they would just solve the Osama Bin Laden problem by just releasing a bunch of dinosaurs and saying, that'll fucking do it. Okay. <laughs> Knowing the history of the United States when it comes to like, the Imperial Adventures, I'm now just picturing the Taliban retaliating or riding dinosaurs into battle. Or ISIS, or ISIL, or whatever you want to fucking call them, ret retaliating by riding dinosaurs into battle in the United States. It's like, oh, fuck, we never saw this coming. <laughs> um... So, we'll look forward to the next film. Um, Dedicated to the brave Mujahideen Triceratops of Afghanistan. That's <laughs> I mean. Yeah. Yeah, very much so. The, the, US, the US is like, well, we fucked this, lads. We gave, we gave them raptors. We made them pinky swear not to do terrorisms. And now there's fucking raptors doing terrorisms everywhere. Can we get someone to genetically modify, like, I don't know, a fucking Yeti or something? I'll be honest, if the, t if the series turned into Yeti versus Raptors, it would wrap back around again into being something I'd kind of want to watch. Like, <laughs> in that very kind of, you know, Sharknado kind of way, it's like, okay, mm. that could be entertaining for a drunk afternoon with some mates. The military guy ends up getting fucked up by the Raptors because obviously he does. And then Chris Pratt and his Raptors defeat the big mutant. And the then ra the Raptors unionize. Oh, no, no, it's dumber than that, Jamie. The, it turns out that they don't tell you that they put raptor DNA in the big dinosaur until this pivotal scene where the raptors confront the big dinosaur and the big dinosaur kind of hoots and whistles at them and the raptors then go, oh, I guess this is the boss and turn on everyone else. Uh, yeah. So the big dinosaur union organizes the raptors into Shy attacking the military. Twist. Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. That's totally what they were going for. Yeah. Yeah. And then it, it does get to the point where, like, the, the, the big one has Chris Pratt cornered with other raptors and it tells them to kill Chris Pratt and they don't want to do it because the lizards have developed compassion or whatever um, and they, they turn on it and then it, the film pretty much just fucking ends there. Oh no, but you're missing the very important detail which is um, they don't kill him because he's got like a packet of jammy dodgers in his pocket or something like that and that's, that's oh. their favourite treat. I mean, that would be a better explanation than... Uh, okay, so Bryce Dallas Howard, right, is playing Chris Pratt's sort of girlfriend personally. It doesn't matter. Um, do they, do they like, antagonise each other but still find each other strangely compelling? Is it that kind of Hollywood book? Yeah, you've, yeah. you've, you've got yeah. it in a one, right? So here's the thing, though. She wears her high heels throughout the entire movie, including when running from dinosaurs. Like, she is, mm. apparently, I am told, and this may be wrong, so again, at me at Wizard Coombs if I'm wrong about this, um, apparently she wanted to do this. She insisted on it because she felt it was right for the character. And this I've reaches, also held that. Yeah. So this reaches its apotheosis when in the final confrontation where the raptors are getting fucked up by the big, like, raptor Frankenstein dinosaur, um, she goes running to the T-Rex enclosure and frees the T-Rex from the first film and then repeats the whole running with a flare thing. Um, which got Malcolm fucked up in the um, the very first film. 
Um, she uses that to get the T Rex to fight the big dinosaur, and then sorry, I'm just picturing her like running out with a flare, and then like there just happens to be a coach party of lawyers coming past, and the, the dinosaur's like <laughs> and just chases them instead. I mean, that would make that would have more value than what you saw. She's literally running in high heels from a T Rex, right, whilst carrying a lit flare. Anyway, so she gets the T Rex to fight the big dinosaur, and the T Rex and the raptor that's left blue, I think fuck up yeah. the big dinosaur which then gets eaten by this like water big dinosaur it just doesn't fucking matter the point is after it's defeated the t-rex and the raptor <laughs> look at each other and kind of give a nod at each other and go their separate ways nice. so, like the big fish dinosaur eats, eats the the other dinosaur and because it's genetically modified it's like stomach doesn't recognize it as food Presumably. Yeah, so it, it's got the sh- it's got really bad dinosaur shits for the next week as a consequence. Because yeah. you can't you, that genetically modified stuff. It's it's just terrible. You know what I mean? Science has gone so, mad. Mm, supposedly, right? The reason the T Rex looks at the the raptor and decides not to fight is because in the first Jurassic Park, it got fucked up by a bunch of raptors, and it's like, oh, it's not worth the trouble. Oh, it's what it's meant to be the same fucking dinosaur. Yes, it is. Explicitly yeah, it's the same so. T Rex from the first film, yeah. There's a whole subplot with Davis not be mentioning where they have like the control room, which is just like the for the funny cutaways essentially, right? And there's yeah. a guy in the control room who's introduced right at the start who gets into trouble. Uh, like the the manager walks in and goes, "You shouldn't be wearing that t-shirt." A lot of people died at, at, died when that went down, and he's wearing an original Jurassic Park t-shirt, right? And he's like, "Oh, but the original park was way cooler than this park," and all this kind of stuff. And, like, it's this fucking meta-commentary. And people are trying to rehabilitate the film by saying, oh, look, it's a meta-commentary on how you can try and remake, like, classics, but the remakes will never be as good as the original. And it's, like, so trying so fucking hard to justify its own existence. I have a zero-tolerance policy for anyone who's like, oh, well, this is shit, but we, we, we're doing it on purpose. It's, like, it's still shit, though. Yeah, yeah. Right, well, you're not going to like one of my takes, but I'm, I will. I will really against that in saying that actually, throughout the film, it's threaded as quite self-conscious in that regard. Like, as, it, honestly, they know they're doing a sequel. They they know they're basically doing a reboot of the fucking thing, and it's not going to live up to the original's fucking glory. They get that, and at least it's addressed in the film. Like, the film is self-aware enough to know that it's not actually Jurassic Park, and it's not going to be that good. And I, I can respect that at the very least. And is this is this the film that was so shit that the uh, director got fired from Star Wars? Mm, um, what? No, blind as it's, well. It, Pre Star Wars. Yeah, but it's Colin Trevorrow, isn't it? That was he was gonna yeah. do he was gonna do episode nine, and then this came out, and everyone went, "Oh, that's a bit shit." And then he was not doing episode no, nine anymore. No, that and, and honestly, that'll be the next one. Honestly, that was the next one, was it? No, the yeah. next one was the next one was directed by J. A. Bayona. I hope I'm Bayona. I hope I'm saying. Oh, J. Bayona, so it was, yeah. Because all I know is Colin Trevorrow was supposed to be doing episode nine, and he didn't, and so we got J. J. Abrams, and what a fucking masterpiece! Like, you know what I mean? He I don't in. think it was that. I think it was a different film that Trevorrow did that completely fucked it. I, I don't think it was this because this did numbers like it did well. Did it? Yeah, no. Like this was a commercial success. It wasn't an artistic yeah. success, but no. Yeah. Well. Um. Yeah, I'm just looking. He was the writer on Fallen Kingdom as well, uh, and he did work on Star Wars: The Rise of Skywalker. I think it was Fallen Kingdom. Like, I think he was meant to be a writer on The Rise of Skywalker, but Fallen Kingdom was so shit. Oh, no, he was, he that... was going to direct. He was going to direct Rise of Skywalker, and then they binned him for some reason, and they got J.J. J. J. Abrams had to do it. Yeah. I don't know, man. I Maybe really only J.J. Abrams could save us from what Ryan Johnson gave us. Maybe that's why. Oh, God. Like, can we not do the Star Wars episode again? Like, yeah. we've, we've, yeah. we've had our takes on it. <laughs> yeah, let's talk. The liberal take on this. You're going to hate me for this. Oh, you're damn right I am. I can feel it already. Go on. There aren't any, because Jurassic World is starship troopers, except about capitalism rather than fascism. There is literally no positive liberal lesson to spin from this film. There's not. I racked my brains over this and there is fucking nothing. So there's not a single liberal positive take you can make from this film. At best, 
you can get some great man theory out of it, possibly at a push, but even then I think you'd be reaching. Yeah, you'd be reaching. I'd agree with that. So you think that this is just, this is like Starship Trippers, which is a much better film. And I really, like, if I'm angry at anything, I'm angry at you invoking that film for this. <laughs> like, you have, you have fucking sullied it in dinosaur shit. Um, like, like Starship Troopers, it's impossible to take any positive reading from it um, that in any way, shape or form says, look, the, the underlying subject material is actually good. Yes. Feels like a exactly challenge. That. It feels like a challenge. I'll tell you what, it's an open challenge to anyone who can find the liberal fucking strand of Jurassic World to come back at me with it because I cannot find a take. I have tried and tried. I don't know how many times. But I sat and watched all these films before we recorded this and I can't, well, not really Jurassic Park 3. I wasn't paying much attention to next shit. But I couldn't find anything for this film. I was trying throughout and I could not find anything. I've got something. Oh, right, okay, that doesn't take long. Go for it. Jurassic Park, Jurassic World, is a cautionary tale that demonstrates how vulture capitalism is cool and good, but not without social cost. Why would liberals engage with that? Because liberals like to hang ring about how they dislike vulture capitalism, it's got all these downsides, whilst they happily engage in it and promote it at every opportunity. Hmm. No, am I not convincing you? No. Elaborate. Go on. Okay. So, what, what do vulture capitalists do? They take a failing enterprise and they reinterpret it and they load it with all its debts and allow it to sink down in failure while strip mining it for any assets that could be useful on the secondary market. And this is what we see in, you know, Jurassic World, because do we? what are we... I think we do, because remember, the escape with the genome of the dinosaurs at the end, that is taken away. That becomes something of a plot point in the later Jurassic Worlds which we'll fucking get to in a second, really strap in, mm. Jamie, if you think this is bad. Um, like, they, they make it out. They, they, they trash the place. They let the, it go bankrupt to take all the debts, but they make it away with the only valuable thing, which is the genetically modified gynos, dinosaur genome, which they can use and resell, resell on the black market for their own nefarious purposes. Mm. And while the film seems to tell you, look, look, this, this vulture capitalism has done bad things in practice, actually, it's cool and good that it's functioned exactly as intended. It was a film, the, the, it was a film the, that was consciously, by its own design, never going to live up to the original Jurassic Park. It was a film that was written to fail in much the same way as this enterprise was inevitably going to fail and al allow the dinosaurs to be extracted and used for profit elsewhere. Which, that would hold up brilliantly if it wasn't the military who were stripping it out. Mm, but is it the military or is it the military-industrial complex? Because I don't think it's the military themselves who are doing it in the film, are they? Mm -hmm, yeah. Mm -hmm, yeah. It's, think me, the, the, the military guy who was, like, weaponized the raptors is absolutely in charge of that. Yeah, but isn't he, like, with Boeing or some other, like, fucking nefarious, like, you know, um, Raytheon... Uh, I don't know, that bit's less clear. So, maybe, maybe. See, my question is, though, could you genetically modify a dinosaur to increase its intelligence to the point where it could come up with a working, like, concept for how to create an internet time zone? No, they did try that, but um, Tony Blair wasn't successful. Yeah, I was, I was about to say, Jamie, it's like we've got proof that you can't because literally the internet time zone idea was made by dinosaurs. Nice. Right. The fifth film. Strap in. This is genuinely <sighs> this is so bad. And I knew it was bad the second I saw the trailer for reasons I'll talk about in a minute. Go on, David. <sighs> oh god. Right. The island is gonna blow up. Not the first island, but the the, the other the second island. Um it's gonna blow up because there's a volcano on it and it's it's become active again. So there's a thing about should we save the dinosaurs? And no one wants to save the dinosaurs, which is the right call. And 
Jeff Goldblum is back arguing that you shouldn't save the dinosaurs. Yeah, again, which is, showing again that he's the only person who understands that dinosaurs are fucking terrible and you shouldn't mess with them or be involved with them in any way, shape or form. Hmm. Um, so Bryce Dallas Howard gets kind of hired to basically do a Jurassic War, uh, Park 2 to go to the island with Chris Pratt and a couple of other minor characters and save as many dinosaurs as they can. The dinosaurs are all loaded onto a boat as the island fucking explodes around them and they all leave as some of the dinosaurs are left to die. Um, in the midst of all that, I should say, the mili- the, 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 the kind of mercenary guys um, shoot Chris Pratt with a tranquilizer gun because they've managed to get the raptor that they wanted and that's all they needed them for and they're just going to leave him on the island to die. See, we Bryce Dallas Howard. They all sneak on, uh, they all sneak back onto the boat and they end up in like a big manor house which is owned by not John Hammond, like his partner that we've never heard of or anything before this point. And it turns out that they actually were taking all the dinosaurs to sell them off on the black market and they have a big auction. And it turns out that they've also been working on another mutant dinosaur. This one's like the, like, like the last one, but smaller this time so that it can get you indoors as well as outdoors. Makes sense. Sounds like exactly the sort of thing they needed at Tora Bora. <laughs> See, I was just thinking it's 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 traditional like corporate, you know, miniaturization processes as first we find in Japan. You know, we've got big mm-hmm. scary dinosaur. Now we're going to make little scary dinosaur. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. The next the next Jurassic Park is going to have a cloud based dinosaur that will fuck you up. <laughs> so when Chris Pratt and Bryce Dallas Howard get caught, they get stuck in a fucking jail cell next to some dinosaurs. They manage to break out of that with the with the unwitting help of the dinosaurs. And then they go ahead and release all the dinosaurs, which leads to the um, mutant one also getting released. And then there's a big fight between the remaining raptor and then the mutant dinosaur. And then after that, they have this... Li- this it's a really weird kind of moral quandary scene where... <laughs> due to previous events, the, the cellar that they're all in with all the dinosaurs um, is filling with gas and it's going to kill them all. But there's a big, big fuck-off button that can release the dinosaurs and they decide whether or not they should release the dinosaurs and it's um, it's decided that the dinosaurs should be released. In the dumbest way possible too, because there's a whole subplot where not John Hammond, the reason John Hammond split up with him, like they revoked their partnership, um, is because this guy was in favour of human cloning, while John Hammond wasn't, right? And the reason we know this is because in the film there's a young girl who you find out is a human clone of the dead daughter of not John Hammond. And the human clone, um, she hears the story of how the dinosaurs were made, and at the end she hits the button to release them all because they were just like her. I mean, this sounds fucking incredible, I'm not going to lie. It's incredible in the sense that it strains credibility, or credulity, I should say. Sorry. Oh, it technically strains both because, I mean, fuck me if I'm going to watch another Jurassic <laughs> Park anytime soon. Yeah, it's it's really not great. Like, the, the guy they got to direct that film, um, that J.A. Biona, like, uh-huh. I think he normally does horror stuff. And, like, they were doing it in this, like, kind of gothic mansion type thing and it was so dark inside it and it was a dinosaur chasing people and they thought, you know, he could make that work. And... <sighs> atmospherically maybe I guess but like plot wise and everything else the the film's a piece of shit it ends with um, Jeff Goldblum, Malcolm whatever his name is, telling us that we're now in the neo-Jurassic period where humans and dinosaurs will have to live alongside each other and with shots of like dinosaurs on the edges of suburbs and all this kind of shit nicely setting up the next film where I can only imagine it's just animal catchers the movie like, I don't fucking know. It's called Jurassic World Dominion, apparently. Who's directing the next one? The uh, next one is being directed by Colin Trevorrow. Oh, him again. Yep, same guy yeah. that Jurassic World. How do you say his last name? Trevorrow. Trevorrow, cool. Okay. They do manage to sell some of the dinosaurs in, like the, the secret black market auction and shit. So, like, who knows where the fuck they're taking it. But it's probably going to be less than good. Like, so I have a question... If I understand it correctly, Blue was the last Velociraptor, right? Yes. 
So there, logically, there's going to be no more Velociraptors then. Unless it turns out, like, that they can change their sex to asexual, in which case there's going to be loads of Velociraptors. I mean, I wouldn't put it past them. Genuinely, like, it annoys me because the very first film was very clever with its whole, you know, we filled them in with frog DNA, whoops, frogs can change gender. Um, we fu done fucked that up. And it was beautifully lampshaded. Like, I don't know, have you ever seen the bit where they get on the plane or the helicopter or whatever it is to go out to the first Jurassic Park compound and Dr. Grant sits down and he oh, goes through his... Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. And he just, he gets two female ends and he goes, fuck it, and just ties a knot. Like, that is Spielberg at, like, his very, yeah. like, his cleverest featherlight touch kind of, I'm setting up something for later. Um, and then you just get all the, all the recent films completely and utterly piss all over all of the very careful work and set up by just having just random shit barreling and out of nowhere. Because as everyone remembers, the, um, the big line from the first film was seatbelts find a way. Yeah, seatbelts <laughs> find a way. Absolutely. <laughs> oh, um, yeah. So the, the, the last film is just a statement that capitalism can't be trusted to act competently when the climate inevitably goes to kill us all. Or you could consider that it's completely openly written as liberal propaganda because it tries to demonstrate the benevolent hand of the free market and it illustrates the danger of shutting them down. Because again, just like in Jurassic Park 2, if Chris Pratt didn't free all those dinosaurs to stop that auction, people wouldn't have died in it. I guess it's a take. I'm going to be honest, David, that one feels a bit lukewarm. I mean, it's lukewarm, but then so is the film. Yeah, yeah. It doesn't deserve a grand take. It really doesn't. No, it doesn't. It doesn't. It's really bad. And it's all because, like, someone came up with a script for Jurassic World 3 that was just, like, absolutely fucking stupid and was all about yes. the militarization of dinosaurs. Yes. And um, was going to have, I shit you not, cyborg, cyborg dinosaurs being controlled by the military was part of the theme. And they had this idea of, like, there being this commando on a motorbike with his cyborg dinosaurs under his control. There's going to be a whole scene around that. And uh, quite wisely, Steven Spielberg said, no, this is dog shit. We're not doing this. This is bad. And so went on to make what was Jurassic World 3. Uh, sorry, Jurassic Park 3. But this script was still floating around. And in the way that, like, you leave a bad idea to sit long enough, it ferments. And eventually someone goes, oh, maybe it's matured now. Um, that's what led to the impetus of a lot of the plot points in Jurassic World and Jurassic World Fallen Kingdom. This is total dog shit. Mm. See, I think the the problem with the uh, the reboot sounds like they, they just don't have any like really truly like a director's director. You know what I mean? Yeah. It sounds like the the spiritual reboot um, is actually the Irishman because Scott says he had a bunch of badly CGI dinosaurs in that. <laughs> Oh, it's always got to go back to the fucking Irishman. <sighs> Man, I like the Irishman. That's the sad thing of it all. And I, I, I honestly, it. it's I mean, yeah, it's, you know, <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's three hours of your life you'll never get back. But I do think it's worth a watch. Um, still though, the CGI. Like I honestly think the CGI choice is deliberate. I really do. I think it adds something to the film having it be kind of slightly off in that way. But. Maybe I'm just, I'm doing that fucking apologising for something that's just objectively bad. Who knows? <laughs> Christ. Oh, right. Well, those are my takes on the five films. That's 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 my reading of it. Um, I stand by the Jurassic World reading. That is, that is the Starship Troopers of capitalism. You keep saying, you keep invoking Starship Troopers. Starship Troopers, is it? <sighs> it's, like, we should do a genuine, like, you know, good films of the 80s cultural podcast episode where we can talk about shit like Starship Troopers and like Robocop and you know various other oh, films and, yeah. yeah so a, a Paul Verhoeven retrospective kind of <laughs> yeah much, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, you know, I, I think I think there's some others we could kind of maybe make work in it but I don't know how you'd thematically kind of do that one I'm not sure because so far we've been doing it by like topics like you know yeah. uh, single series I'm not sure you can really Unless you literally just did the Paul Verhoeven, but I feel like that's... But I think the problem with that is the films are good. Like, all the films we've touched on so far have had glaring fucking problems, which is part of what's if made any, it work. Yeah, if any listeners haven't noticed yet, we're not professional film critics. I mean, speak for yourself. 
Yeah, I'm not sure if you're familiar with Jamie's column in the Daily Star, but... <laughs> Send him a popcorn bomb my bell end. <laughs> And yeah, his, his funnily enough, his, the title of his column is indeed Cinema Bellin, so. <laughs> oh, um, Just entirely yeah. sight sightings of Vince Vaughn. <laughs> <laughs> James, I think you had some takes prepared as well, didn't you? I kind of do, but to be honest, they're still like, okay, I'll give it, I'll give the too long didn't read versions of these takes, right? And then you can mull right. over how true they are or not, Okay. My take is that they're all about how neoliberalism fails in different ways, and how the failure of neoliberalism can be seen in the way different institutions collapse because of it, okay? And so the first Jurassic Park, it's the collapse of the traditional company, traditional kind of corporation, you know, they, because it doesn't spend money on the fundamentals, because it doesn't put in the base stuff that has to be there and invest wisely, and instead spurges it all in kind of marketing and presentation, the company ultimately kind of collapses, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The, se the second one, The Lost World Jurassic Park, that's about how neoliberalism inevitably leads to the hollowing out of culture. And the kind of collapse, if you will, of the kind of community space that depends on it. And it all basically revolves around the fact that um, essentially the whole T-Rexes in San Diego kind of element of it all is all showing how neoliberalism's kind of consequences, its tertiary kind of effects, will come home to roost in the suburbs and like tear everything the fuck up. And the movie itself, like the whole fact is it's San Diego, it is part of kind of, you know, the West Coast America, it is the home of American culture, it itself is being fatally undermined by the excesses and kind of implications of neoliberalism. Which leads us on to Jurassic Park 3, which is, oh, it goes deeper than that. So we've had the company failing, we've had like the culture and the suburbs kind of failing. Now we, Jurassic Park 3 is all about the family failing and the family being torn apart by neoliberalism. Are you saying that neoliberalism isn't ready for the wife's boyfriend? Yes, yes, neoliberalism is not ready for that. It's not ready, for, like, the whole divorced couple dynamic is central to the third film. Because remember, kid goes missing um, from his divorced parents, right? Who are then forced to, like, try and get him back by coming together. Um, you know, like, neoliberalism's consequences has torn their child from them. And then during that film, the eggs of fucking velociraptors get stolen from them, and it breaks down their family and causes their family to engage in a kind of conflict. And ultimately, this familial conflict is, you know, found uh, resolved by an application of military force. Um, the military has become the unifying factor of the family, brought in by the fucking wife's ex, the fucking wife's boyfriend, right? Like, that's the only thing that can restore something approximating the status quo. The family itself is undermined by neoliberalism. Cool, yeah, checks out. I'm trying to fucking remember what my, my, my one was for Jurassic World again. Ah, yeah, so... So for Jurassic World, it's not bad enough that neoliberalism has torn apart the traditional business corporate structure, has torn about the suburb cultural background, has torn apart the family. Oh no, now it must tear apart your past. And I think it very much speaks for itself, <laughs> right? It's got to monetize, it's got to fuck up your past as well. The the implications of it ruin the original film, essentially. And they even have a guy in there talking about how all the original was so much better, drawing attention to it. It couldn't be its own thing. It has to stand on the bones of the past and shit all over them to make its profit. And so that's what that's what Jurassic World is about. And then Fallen Kingdom. Fallen Kingdom has taken it even further. We've seen the state ta start to collapse through these films. It's collapsed at business. It's collapsed at suburban culture. It's collapsed in family. It's collapsed in past, in cultural mythos and history. Now, now the very ability of a state to insist upon itself, to enforce its existence in the world is collapsing because Jurassic World Fallen Kingdom is literally a fallen kingdom. It's literally the fall of empire. It's about how the military itself has become so corrupted and incompetent off the back of neoliberalism. And so you've got essentially the dinosaurs. They are the new, you know, fighter jets being produced by the US military. Utterly impractical, can't function in any way, shape or form. They're like, you know, they crash out the sky when it rains. Um, and yet, and yet, all this time and effort and energy and billions have been poured into their creation as a grift to enrich people. 
And so, yes, the Jurassic Park series as a whole chronicles the fall of America, starting with the engine of its economy and rippling right on through to its ability to do military force projection. Ta-da! I could see that, yeah. Yeah, I love it. I love it. The F-35 Velociraptor. Exactly. Exactly. I don't really have anything else. Like, if you're looking for a serious take on the Jurassic Park films, all I can say is that the first one... Jurassic Park was Steven Spielberg doing a tour de force of the golden age of cinema, so to speak, where he drew upon contemporary and kind of historical cinematic elements to weave together a story which drew from different genres and was more than the sum of its parts. Like the whole sequence with the velociraptors hunting the kids, that's like your, you know, your psycho killer kind of, you know, mm. um, thriller kind of angle. Um, it's got your sci-fi elements. It's got your kind of, you know, um, interpersonal drama romances you know it's got it's got a lot going on there being woven together as this kind of celebration of look at the, the glory of what cinema can accomplish and look at what steven spielberg can do when he's showing off and then all the films that have come after that have they've been aping the original to try and extract profits from it but they, they can't touch it because the the original film was very much um like a master of cinema at his craft showing off all the things that cinema can do and now that's been done, you can't continue to show them off again by aping them. They're basically they're attempting to be pastiches and failing. So there you go. That's a serious take on it. There's no real lesson of morality to it. It's just being regurgitated because capitalism. Yeah. I'm just, yeah. <laughs> Can I say, right, the most... I didn't actually see Jurassic uh, World Fallen Kingdom. And the reason I didn't see it, because I saw, like, okay, so I saw Jurassic World in cinema and I thought, <sighs> that was, I mean, that passed the time. Okay, yeah, you and then you can't say that hasn't happened. Yeah, like you, you, you know, you you don't go in and go. Well, I feel like I've aged twice as much as you know before I, I walked in. I don't feel like the years are weighing on me now. Like really bad films have. Instead, it's just like okay, this has happened. You passed the time. Maybe you had fun with your friends. You get to talk about it a bit. It is a cultural touchstone, if you will, in the sense that it's some shit to talk about on a podcast or over a pint or whatever. Fallen Kingdom I didn't see, uh, and I didn't see it because I saw the trailer for it. And as soon as I saw the trailer, I was like, right, okay. It has now become completely and utterly detached from the grounding that's necessary to make these films work. Because here's an important thing, right? Dinosaurs brought back to life. They had to work really hard in the first Jurassic Park to make that feel grounded and possible and to suspend disbelief. And so they had the genetics explanations and all this stuff that, like, is science fiction. They worked quite hard to work into the text to let you kind mm -hmm. of go into it and go, okay, yeah, dinosaurs in the real world. I, I, can, I can turn off my brain and be on board with this. Jurassic World Fallen Kingdom, in its trailer, it has a pyroclastic flow coming off a volcano. And it has the dinosaurs running away from it. And it has some of them in one of those weird globe kind of cars running away from it. And it has Chris Pratt on foot running away from it. And then it catches up with him as he reaches the cliffs and the um, globe goes over the cliff and falls in the water. Now, here's the thing. Pyroclastic flows are like several hundred degrees in temperature. They are not just ash. They are volcanic gases and if you get caught by one, it literally singes you to death. Think Pompeii. Pompeii was a pyroclastic flow, okay? If you are in a pyroclastic flow, you're dead. You cannot survive it. The guys who are in the ball, right, when it goes over the cliff, I'm like, okay, maybe maybe the vehicle they're in lets them survive just those few seconds extra so that when they hit the cold water down below, they survive it. That's okay. That's maybe a little bit credible. But Chris Pratt is on foot. Chris Pratt fucking died in Jurassic World Fallen Kingdom. There is no way, shape or form, no earthly explanation that could say Chris Pratt isn't fucking vulcanized the second he gets hit by that shit. And yet, seeing that trailer, I'm like, there's no way they're killing Chris, Chris Pratt off like that. There's no way they're doing that. He must survive. Chris Pratt is immune to volcanoes. Yeah, Fuck this. Hollywood just doesn't understand how volcanoes work. Well, here's the dumb thing. Like, they did those, like, okay, the, what was it? They did Volcano and Dante's Peak, right? And Volcano is shit, and the science in it is shit, and we're not going to talk about it. Dante's Peak actually had not terrible stuff in it. It was a bit dramatised, but they got the idea that, like, you know, pyroclastic flows are a bad a, a bad deal, and, oh, look, water bodies around volcanoes can acidify really quickly, and, like, a whole bunch of different things okay, in that. Okay, but there's, the a bit, there's a bit in Dante's Peak where he drives across lava, and his car doesn't just immediately melt. Depends on the temperature of a lava, that is possible. You can walk across lava, um... 
like you've got to be very fucking careful and very very quick and it depends on the lava but honestly i don't fucking remember you would you would have to do like an, a scene by scene analysis of it to be able to guess whether it's possible but you want to know the biggest thing here is you only watch the trailer there's a bit in the film that's going to make you even fucking madder about lava <laughs> go on david fucking make me enrage me Fill me with hatred to sustain so, me through this week. One of the uh, one of the dinosaurs getting a Range Rover and drive across the lava. <laughs> <laughs> so Chris Pratt gets tranquilized um, yep. at one point, and, and he's fucking can he move? Paralyzed, and he he wakes up as he sees lava flowing towards him, and he has right. to like slowly drag himself over a log to escape the lava, and it's right. like inches away from for like an extended period of time so i'm gonna ask a really dumb question what speed is the lava mm -hmm. flowing at i'm assuming it's flowing quite quickly no it's very slow oh it's very slow what color was it was it black or was it like bright red or what a nice bright orange bright orange he's dead yeah he's fucking dead he's dead twice over now okay <laughs> he's he, oh. like when when lava cools and it forms a crust, like people have done these these things about well, what happens if you fall into lava, and it's like, well, it depends, right? Because um, if it's really liquid lava, you hit it like it's concrete, and then you immediately incinerate. That's it. And if it's uh, not liquid lava, if it started to cool quite a bit, then it might have a crust on the surface, which will still scorch the shit out of you, but it might not insta kill you. And so it is possible, like, there are, you know, there's pictures of, I can't remember the technical term, volcanologist, is it? Like, walking mm -hmm. across lava, and, like, you know, they're wearing protective suits that reflect the heat, because that's still a thing, and still a big deal. Like, they can they can sort of survive in proximity to it. And there's other pictures of people, like, with quite cooled, very, very slow cooling lava, who are able to, like, trot across it. And it, like, totally fucks up their footwear, but it is a thing that can happen. And there were, like, um, pictures of this happening in Hawaii when it started all the, you know, really big re-eruptions. Um, like lava is a is a complicated thing. It's molten rock, and depending on how cool it is, depends on just how many seconds your footwear can survive. But um, the interesting thing about stuff that gets warm is the warmer it gets, the brighter it gets. Okay, and lava, even black lava, lava which is cooled and has a crust, that is really fucking hot. And if Chris Pratt was lying next to it, that'd be like you know baking in Ibiza on a hot fucking day. In the best case scenario, if it's if it's orange or if it's glowing in any way shape or form the thermal radiation being put out for it because that's literally what it is that's what that light is um he would be his skin would probably combust probably just from the, the ambient radiant heat <sighs> that doesn't happen and no i am not surprised it doesn't happen of course it doesn't fucking happen because <laughs> with a chin like that he must be immune to lava of course just like this is the thing it's General point, Hollywood, whenever it does all these remakes and shit, they can't take their subject matter seriously. They can't take it seriously. They, they can't look at it and go, this thing, this was genuine and it had these stakes and it worked hard to be grounded. And it happens in all sorts of like, you know, remake fiction. Instead, they're just like, oh, people don't care about this shit and just like toss stuff out. And they just try and tell stuff because the spectacle is more important than the substance. But the substance is what made people immersed in the spectacle and willing to kind of enjoy it. And it really annoys me. It really upsets me. The only kind of semi-remake film, and it wasn't really a remake that I've seen recently, that does an effort to try and make itself like fit is the, the Blade Runner, what, 2049, was it? Um, yeah, that was good, yeah. Yeah, that was good. That took seriously its subject matter. I that took that. it really... It's good. I actually think you'd like it, Jamie. It's a genuinely good film. Um, it's. I would say it's better than the original. I know that's heresy for a variety of different reasons, but it <laughs> well, doesn't well, have Harrison. Which version of the original? Because there's about 15. <laughs> well, there. yeah, okay, yeah, fair. It's better than the official director's cut of the original, if only because it doesn't have Harrison Ford doing a sexual assault in it. Fair. But, um, yeah, like, I don't know. So you get all these Jurassic Parks and they're like, ah, oh, you know, dinosaurs are a thing. We don't need to work hard at it. Um, uh, uh, you know, volcano explosions, how do they work? Who cares? You know? And it's like Star Wars, like people complain about it in Star Wars too. Um, I'm, I'm fucking going there. I'm sorry. I, I, I shouted at you earlier, David, but I'm going to do it. In the last <laughs> Star Wars film, they have the fucking fleet of Star Destroyers lifting off the planet with no explanation and shit. And people are like, where did this come from? How did this happen? How does this make sense? The, they are annoyed by the lack of internal consistency in it. 
that it, but instead, no, it's just a cool spectacle. And that's the same sort of shit you're seeing happening with all of these reboots. They don't take, they, like, they, they don't look at the originals and go, these were really beautiful or good or they had something interesting about them. Let's try and remake that. Instead, they look at originals and go, oh, these sold really well. You know? Yeah, it's, it's so long as you nail the aesthetic, you've got it. Like, um, like again, I'll, I'll, since you've fucking opened the door, I'll just do it then. Um, Star Wars, so episode eight. Um, you know, when it's the, the rebel fleets try to escape the massive fuck off Star Destroyer and its fleet and they're just yeah. out of range and Star Destroyer's firing like the odd laser and the lasers are for some reason arcing as if they're like artillery yeah. in space. Yeah. Like, because they were going for that heavy World War Two aesthetic. The, the one, the same aesthetic that made like a new hope really fucking successful. Like the fucking trench run was off. It was basically fucking dam busters, but in space. And they were yeah. trying to nail that. Like they did earlier on, with like those big stupid fucking bombers, and that totally fucked up because I don't know what the fuck they were trying with that. Um, but like they, they were just trying to nail the the feel and the look of the thing, and they just totally fucked it up because it was like well, that's not really fucking consistent. That doesn't make any sense. Literally, and- every single space scene in the entirety of Star Wars exists to wind up like. Uh, astrophysicists yeah do you know what I mean it's like oh there's <laughs> yeah. noises in space and like the, the ships are just like planes but in space and you know what I mean the, the spaceships can... the spaceships are going to run out of fuel and then stop moving as if they've like you know what I mean as if they've suddenly lost traction <laughs> it's just you know what I mean the whole thing is, yeah. is just designed to piss off Carl Sagan's ghost quite frankly <laughs> There is a spectre haunting Star Wars. Yeah. <laughs> like, the the thing about it, though, is Star Wars adapted essentially the mythos and around the, like, you know, the world wars, etc., and plugged them into a film. And mm-hmm. you, can do, you can do that as long as you don't have anything that's blatantly self-contradictory. You can make that shit work. But people have the same complaints, like, uh, the new Trek films, particularly... Um, Fuck Star Trek Into Darkness, one where they, they bring back Khan. Oh, don't even, get, very, me, don't yeah. even get me fucking started on Star Trek Into Darkness. J.J. <laughs> J. Abrams is a fucking hack, like. Yes, exactly, right? I actually quite liked the first of the Star Wars, uh, Star Wars, <laughs> Star Trek yeah. movies. I actually quite liked that film a little bit. It was bit. all right, yeah. Yeah, yeah it, wasn't, then, it wasn't a bad film. Yeah, exactly. And then they did Into Darkness, and it is just, again, it's we're going to hollow out something that's previously been done. And Star Trek Into the f- Darkness is the most phoned-in thing I've ever seen. Because exactly. by the time that attempt started making that, he knew he was going off to do Star Wars, and he clearly wanted to do that more. And so it's yeah. like it's it's the Game of Thrones season eight of films, basically. Yes, <laughs> and like they have the they have the whole you know the you know the the Enterprise is being chased by a big bad Enterprise like whatever it is and they have sounds like a fucking like aircraft bomber kind of catching up you know with a hum of the engines and all this kind of shit and it's like that made a lot of Star Trek nerds pretty mad but it's like yeah it's like you know it's not the it, the sound choices are a bit weird it's not the worst but what really fucked up was just the entire dynamics like they you know, they, they set all these ideas in previous Star Treks about how all the warp technology and all this shit works and how it all holds together. And it's like, it's basic stuff, but it, you know, like for fiction to work, there has to be rules. You can't just yeah. have, and then the ghost does this. And it's like, but hang on, it's an incorporeal ghost. How is it able to, to do said thing? Or you can't have, oh, and then the dinosaur starts, you know, um, figuring out the numbers on the keypad. But wait a minute. I mean, okay, how does it, that doesn't make sense with anything you've established. There's like, there's got to be rules so that the audience can predict things ahead of the characters and see it coming. You have to have that. You have to have the ability for the audience to go, oh, they think they're safe, but the dinosaurs, they've, they've shown their intelligence. They, maybe the velociraptor will know how to work a door handle, you know? Like shit like that. You've got to kind of have that there. And a lot of these remakes, they just, they just throw shit. They just throw shit around. They don't have any respect for what's already been established. We don't have respect for the intelligence of the audience. And they're not, like, here's the fucking thing about it. Going by sales, they're not entirely wrong, you know? They're not entirely wrong. Um, Jurassic World, like, sold. The Star Trek Into Darkness did okay in cinema, you know? Um, didn't do as, the sequels to them didn't do as well as a consequence of the corners they cut, but... You can't really argue with a make a quick buck kind of philosophy that Hollywood yeah. is doing if they're prepared to hollow everything out. 
It's a shame as well because the third of the new Star Trek films was actually pretty damn good. Yeah. I heard that. I've not seen it. It's, is it it's, worth watching? Yeah, it's yeah. worth a watch. Okay, you know what? I think I know what I'm doing tonight after we're finished here. Mm. I also, I think I know what we should do for our next one. Forget the 80s. We should. We've done, we've done Jurassic Park. We've done Star Wars. We've done, God, what was the other one we did? Marvel, right? Mm-hmm. We, should, we should do Star Trek. We should seriously do Star Trek. And, um, yes. Because there is a lot of shit in there that deserves, you know, commentary, ridicule, and I think could be quite fun. Yeah, but there's just so mm. much fucking Star Trek, though, aren't there? We'll be on for days. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> yeah, at some point, at some point, we need to do Die Hards as well. Yeah, or we would do. Um, oh, yeah. Okay, to be decided. Audience, mm. if you're listening to this, all two of you, uh, one of whom is now like decided to cancel the pod because of her opinions we expressed tonight. Like, we will come back to you with fucking, which one we're going to do next. I tell you who's I tell you who's listening and decided to cancel the pod. If anyone, it'd be fucking uh, Benedict Cumberbatch because we've just dragged the shit out of everything he's involved with lately, haven't we? You know what I mean? <laughs> Sherlock, yeah, we have. <laughs> Sherlock was fucking piss and like Star Trek into fucking wank. You know what I mean? Just <laughs> the the Hobbit was garbage too. Yeah. Oh, I, I absolutely mm-hmm. like. He's just, he's just a fucking curse, really, like, any, you know what I mean? He, he, he seems to be... Tell you what, name me one good thing that Benedict Cumberbatch has been in. I don't hate Doctor Strange. Yeah, I don't hate Doctor Strange, and um, Avengers Endgame, at least, was, was a good film. And he was uh, in that, so... Uh, okay, I'll, I'll reluctantly give you that one. It's definitely, it's definitely his least Benedict Cumberbatch performance, though, isn't it? Yeah, it is, mm. it is, you're right. Well, fuck it. Any closing thoughts on Jurassic World, Jamie? Or Jurassic Park, sorry. See what I mean? Like, the, the new one has destroyed the original. Anyway, carry on. Uh, I, I, well, no one, no one, you, you, you promised there was some sort of thing about the raptors using guns and then you never got around to it. Oh, it was because the, um, because the script that they had for Jurassic World, uh, sorry, Jurassic Park 3, fucking hell, it was about the cyborg, like, um, you know, velociraptors. They had guns. They were cyborg velociraptors with guns, was the original script call. And so what's probably going to happen if, you know, we see things the way we expect it will, I bet you Jurassic World Dominion is going to have militarized dinosaurs versus free range organic dinosaurs. See what it is? I I see this going the way of the fucking Planet of the Apes reboot, where it just, the, the, the the concepts involved just get more and more ridiculous and you don't know anyone (laughs) who's actually watching them. And they go, well, they made, they've made eight of those so far and you go, what, really? How many? Do, I don't even know how many we've had. Anyway, uh, I want it. to see John Woo direct a film where raptors are like diving around with a, with akimbo Uzis, doing the full Max <laughs> Payne thing. You know what I mean? I mean, I would watch it. Yeah, like I don't know. There's something to be said for trash that's very self-aware about itself, but it has to like it has to really commit to it. Like I don't know that. And, um, and yet you reject Jurassic World. Yeah, but here's the thing. It's it's trying to not be trash. That's because it knows it's the Starship triples of capitalism. <sighs> Can we end the fucking pod now? <laughs> yeah, on that angering note, um, we'll see you later. Alright. Catch you later. Have fun.